Hello and welcome to today's session of the NPTEL course entitled Introduction to World Literature. Today we are looking at a short story, Solid Objects, written by Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf is one of the foremost writers of the modernist period. She is a British writer and um, this is one short story which has received very little critical attention compared to her other towering, uh, compared to her other works, especially the uh, her novels such as uh, Mrs. Dalloway, Orlando and the Lighthouse, which had a towering status as far as literary claim is concerned. So, compared to that, her short stories were largely ignored. So, I take this opportunity to present to you this short story, Solid Objects, which I also considered as one of the finest works of the modernist period, which also conveys to us the hollowness that was felt during the modernist period, in the, especially in the, uh, during the interwar years, during the uh, first, wo uh, first World War and right after that. So, the story is set in London in 1920s. This is the post war period after the first World War and it also signals a number of changes which had been happening in the society. Though there is no very direct critique of anything of the society or the, uh, the, the contemporary politics that, uh, that we can find in this short story, there is a way in which through just two characters and with very minimal action, very minimal set of events happening, we find Wolf very efficiently capturing the essence of modernism. Uh, as the story opens, we find two upper class males at the beach. I will read out the first uh, segment to you. The only thing that moved upon the wa vast semicircle of the beach was one small black spot. As it came nearer to the ribs and spine of the stranded pilchard boat, it became apparent from a certain tenuity in its blackness that this spot possessed four legs. And moment by moment, it became more unmistakable that it was composed of the persons of two young men. Even thus in outline against the sand, there was an unmistakable vitality in them, an indescribable vigor in the approach and withdrawal of the bodies, slight though it was, which proclaimed some violent argument issuing from the tiny mouths of the little round heads. This was corroborated on closer view by the repeated longing of a walking stick on the right hand side. You mean to tell me you actually believe this the walking stick on the right hand side next the waves seem to be asserting as it cut long straight stripes upon the sand. So, here we find two upper class males uh, in conversation and we will get to know that it is largely about politics and look at the way in which the story begins. There is a zooming in which happens, it is very graphic, very visual and there is a way in which the story zooms in into the two individuals and their lives and the integrities that become part of uh, the story. The setting at the outset tells us hardly anything about the story, we get to know nothing at all about the characters or about the action or about how the story is going to go forward. And in the next segment, politics be damned, issue it clearly from the body on the left hand side and as these words were uttered, the mouths, noses, chins, little moustaches, tweed caps, rough boots, shooting coats and check stockings of the two speakers became clearer and clearer. The smoke of their pipes went up into the air, nothing was so solid, so living, so hard red, soot and virile as these two bodies for miles and miles of sea and sand. Justifying the title solid objects, we find this short story right at the outset focusing on the material, focusing on the solid elements and focusing on the materiality of the body as well as the things that are surrounded uh, over there. And it also talks about two people as two bodies. The body on the left hand side and the body on the right hand side and about the details such as the the tiny mouths of the little round heads or the mouth noses chins. So, there is a particularity that the story begins to focus on, we get a hang of the narration in that sense. So, if you are familiar with this short story which is uh, uh, a highly readable and very short story you will get to know that there are two major characters here, John and Charles and John is currently a member of the parliament and he is also a candidate for, uh, in, in, for an important office, an important uh, party position and Charles is a very close confidant and also one of his greatest friends and the story takes a turn when John 
the one who is set to scale uh, greater heights in his political career, he suddenly discovers this obsessive passion, his passion for solid objects. Let's see how that's described here. So this is how Charles and John are introduced to us. So Charles, whose stick had been slashing on the beach for half a mile or so, began skimming flat pieces of slate over the water. And John, who had exclaimed, politics be damned, began burrowing his fingers down, down into the sand, as his hand went further and further beyond the wrist, so that he had to hitch his sleeve a little higher, his eyes lost their intensity, or rather the background of thought and experience, which gives an inscrutable depth to the eyes of grown people disappeared, leaving only the clear, transparent surface, expressing nothing but wonder, which the eyes of young children display. No doubt the act of burrowing in the sand had something to do with it. No, he remembered that after digging for a little, the water oozes round your fingertips. The hole then becomes a moat, a well, a spring, a secret channel to the sea. As he was choosing which of these things to make it, still working his fingers in the water, they curled round something hard, a full drop of solid matter and gradually dislodged a large irregular lump and brought it to the surface. When the sand coating was wiped off a green tint appeared, it was a lump of glass. So thick as to be almost opaque, the smoothing of the sea had completely worn off any edge or shape, so that it was impossible to say whether it had been bottle, tumbler or window pane. It was nothing but glass. It was almost a precious stone. You only had to enclose it in a rim of gold or pierced it with a wire and became a jewel, part of a necklace or a dull green light upon a finger. And thus it goes. So we find here that nothing dramatic happens, but the twist itself is very, very dramatic. John, who is taking a stroll by the beachside along with Charles, the one who, the, the, the two friends who are clearly discussing politics and suddenly we find John saying, down with the politics and he gets obsessed with this solid object that he finds. He is digging for it and he is finding it and he finds it very, very precious. Before we continue with the discussion of the story, I want you to uh, think about what modernism was and how that changed the way in which uh, literature began to be understood and how representations began to be changed. Uh, we all are familiar with the historical setting and the many things which happened as a, and in the backdrop of modernism, almost running up to modernism from the late uh, 19th century onwards, the Industrial Revolution being one of the important key events and then there were the revolutions of 1848, 1848 as you, uh, as we all know, it was called as the year of revolutions across Europe, not just in, uh, you, uh, not just in uh, Britain, it was called as the year of revolutions across Europe. And there was also the significant First World War in the early 20th century. So all of these events, these political historical events, they had a significant role to play in the shaping of modernism. We shall not go into the details of it, but I just want to leave you with this thought. And the Dominic Head, uh, one of the historians and one of the literary critics of the modernist period, he had argued that short story encapsulates the essence of literary modernism because there's a way in which the short story manages to capture the nature of 20th century episodic experience. So here what we get to know is not the larger picture. In this short story, what we get to know is the episodic nature and the episodic details about the many events which are also, which, which can also be considered as the repercussion or the aftermath of the larger bigger events which were happening in history, in society and at the national and international level. So. We find Wolf focusing on ordinary solid items here and we find this description throughout this short story and if you look for a way in which we can summarize this short story, you will also get to know that there's hardly any story here, it, there's hardly any story here. It is about a man, John, one who has an aspiring political career, one who has a promising political career. He is allowing solid objects, he is allowing an, an obsessive relation with solid objects to take over his passion, to take over his career and eventually take over his um, rational self itself. So what makes this story enduring? What makes this story uh, 
uh, representative one of the modernist period is the way in which it, uh, uh, it represents child's incomprehension of this brick brack that is happening. So, the story is about Charles as much as it is about John. John is the one who is who has discovered this insane passion for objects and he is going after them in an obsessive way. And we find Charles completely unable to comprehend the nature of this passion and we find him in spite of trying really hard to reach out we find him left with utter dismay and he has any other, no other option but to just leave uh, John at the end of it. So, this is about that modernist crisis about the inability to communicate and also about the inability to comprehend things in spite of trying, despite trying to reach out and there is this elusive nature which we find in this short story throughout much as where we try to find a rationale for John's obsession. Even if you read a very, very close reading of the story it is very hard to get a background to it, it is very hard to get a flashback which will tell us clearly why this had happened. And this deference of the meaning making process and this uh, elusive nature of the meaning making process also remains very, very central to most modernist writing, most uh, literary modernist writings as we would know. I find the description of this object that uh, John gets hold of very, very compelling. And look at the way in which Wolf is also trying to tell us how this object has the capacity to transform it itself into something valuable the moment it becomes uh, enclosed in a rim of gold or the moment it is pierced with a wire, how the value addition becomes a very external thing, how it is possible to say that there is no inherent value, but it is all about the value which is being attributed to the object which is in hand. And uh, coming down we also see him getting obsessively attached to the object that he has found. John turned it in his hands, he held it to the light, he held it so that its irregular mass blotted out the body and extended right arm of his friend, the green thinned and thickened slightly as it was held against the sky or against the body. It pleased him, it puzzled him, it was so hard so concentrated, so definite an object compared with the vague sea and the hazy shore. And this is important, it is a different kind of realism also that mm, Wolf is perhaps trying to attempt over here. She is trying to compare the solidity of this object, the, hard, the hardness of the object, the concrete nature of the object against the abstract things which one sees around here it being the vague sea and the hazy show. Of course, those are also material beings, but the way in which uh, Wolf is looking at objects, the way in which uh, Wolf is trying to uh, approach the solidity of objects is very modernist in nature. And we do not find her romanticizing the beach, romanticizing the sea or the sunset in any way. On the other hand, what is being romanticized here is that solid objects which begins to acquire value only when it is looked at, only when it is seen through John's eyes. Otherwise, it is just one forgettable thing, one among the many forgettable things which we see around and that materiality is something uh, Wolf also draws, wants to draw our attention to. If we also draw your attention to some of the controversial, some of the hard hitting things that modernist art itself had been trying to do. The art exhibit uh, titled uh, The Fountain, the inverted urinal getting converted into an object of art that itself is one of uh, the uh, most interesting cases in point. And we also realize that there is a way in which here Wolf also tries to subvert the ways in which materiality or value becomes significant or insignificant uh, in, in, in very relative terms. And as soon as this obsession takes over, as soon as John finds himself uh, almost losing himself in this object, how it pleased him, it puzzled him and how that becomes the reality for him than anything which is happening around him. We find that the communication lines also begin to get cut off between John and Charles. Uh, they ate their sandwiches side by side. 
When they had done, they were shaking themselves and rising to their feet. John took the lump of glass and looked at it in silence. Charles looked at it too, but he saw immediately that it was not flat. And filling his pipe, he said with the energy that dismisses a foolish strain of thought, to return to what I was saying. So, this is significant. Charles also sees it, but he returns to what he was saying. And here we find that this is what differentiates Charles from John. This is that line which can be drawn between John and Charles. Both of them, they see it and it is accessible to both of them and both of them, they manage to touch it. But the way they respond to the solidity of that material world, the way they respond to the object that has come to their hand, that is what makes it entirely different. And look at what John does now. He did not see or if he had seen would hardly have noticed that John after looking at the lump for a moment as if in hesitation slipped it inside his pocket. And we find that the story is taking an interesting turn now. There is hardly any significant action over here. If you uh, survey this from the beginning, we notice that there is hardly anything which is happening here except for John's transformation which is gradual in a certain way, but that's also very, very sudden. And we find that even before he realizes it, John finds himself obses obsessively attached to this, uh, obsessively attracted to this object and he slips it within his pocket. It becomes a part of him. That impulse too may have been the impulse which leads a child to pick up one pebble on a path strewn with them promising it a life of warmth and security upon the nursery mantelpiece, delighting in the sense of power and benignity with such which such an action confers and believing that the heart of the stone leaps with joy when it sees itself chosen from a million like it to enjoy this bliss instead of a life of cold and wet upon the high road. I might so easily have been any other of the millions of stones, but it was I, I, I. The image of the child coming in cannot be ignored over here at all. And it's the second time if you notice that this image is being brought into this story. John feels the excitement of a child. And if you uh, think about it in uh, the way in the, uh, James Joyce, not the significant modernist writer, the way he begins his uh, important uh, work, the portrait of the artist as a young man, it begins with baby talk. There's a way in which childhood or the language of the child or the behavior of the child is used as something to retain originality, to get back to some kind of authenticity which no longer was there during the modernist period. And we find that same attempt perhaps in a different way being made over here. We find that John is being compared, John's excitement and John's sincerity, John's attachment to this object is being compared to that of a child. And in the same way that piece of glass, that stone also gets some life. And this personification is significant as well. I, it might so easily have been any other of the million stones, but it was I, I, I. So the value attributed to this object, which is otherwise nothing, it also increases exponentially as the story progresses. As we read on, we find John very gradually, but uh, in a very steady way, descending into complete insanity and uh, he reaches a point where even Charles is unable to rescue him and his office space we find that getting completely transformed into something like a madman studio and we realize that he is beyond redemption by the time the story ends. We can skip a few details and come to the end of this story where we find Charles making an attempt to finally uh, reach out, uh, making an attempt to reach out to John one more time. What was the truth of it, John? Asked Charles suddenly, turning and facing him. What made you give it up like that all in a second? So now we get to know that the beginning of the story is actually beginning to make it, it's actually making a sense. John just gave it up, gave it up all in a second. And we don't know what had happened prior to that moment, but there is that moment that comes into his life where he holds this object and he realizes that nothing else is worth pursuing. Not a promising political career, not a promising uh, office in his uh, uh, party. And he does not want to be the office holder of any important position. Instead, he just wants to possess these series of solid objects which mean nothing to the others.
halfway through the story we are also being told about this transition, the transformation which was becoming evident to everyone and how it had completely changed his life. He was no longer young. His career, that is his political career, was a thing of the past. People gave up visiting him. He was too silent to be worth asking to dinner. He never talked to anyone about his serious ambitions. Their lack of understanding was apparent in their behavior. That is the crux of the story as well, the lack of understanding, that inability to understand the kind of passion that John has for something which does not have any value at all. I'm not very sure whether even in the contemporary things have really changed or whether we are able to understand this kind of uh, uh, passion which beats all kinds of rationality. Coming back to the end of the story, when Charles asks him, what made you give it up like that all in a second? John replies, I've not given it up. But you're not the ghost of a chance now, said Charles roughly. I don't agree with you there, said John with conviction. Charles looked at him and was profoundly uneasy. The most extraordinary doubts possessed him. He had a queer sense that they were talking about different things. He looked around to find some relief for his horrible depression, but the disorderly appearance of the room depressed him still further. What was that stick and the old carpet bag hanging against the wall? And then those stones, looking at John, something fixed and distant in his expression alarmed him. He knew Uli too well that his mere appearance upon a platform was out of the question. Pretty stones, he said as cheerfully as he could, and saying that he had an appointment to keep, he left John forever. And it's very evident that Charles barely had a choice because here he finds his friend slipping away into madness, into complete insanity, and he also realizes that they had always been talking about entirely different things. And this is significant because even at the sto as the story begins, we get this feeling that the body on the left and the body on the right are not really on the same page. The body on the left and the body on the right are talking about two entirely different things, obsessing about two entirely different things. It's just that chance had brought them together, pursuing similar kinds of ambitions, but it certainly was not there to stay. Attempting to make further sense of the story, I want to draw your attention to Walter Benjamin's discussions on the impulse to collect. According to Walter Benjamin, he was a Marxist uh, critic, uh, he identified this impulse to collect as an anarchic impulse and that is a situation in which the desire for the object precedes reason. In other words, the collector or the character uh, in this story, John, we find him uh, approaching objects with some kind of a democratic attitude and this is what Walter Benjamin also had pointed out that this collector who is anarchic, who is working under this anarchic impulse, he also has a democratic attitude towards the material world where he sees junk shops and museums and the things that he gets from the roadside in similar ways. And that's a kind of anarchy and that's a kind of democracy that he celebrates as well. And there are three kinds of collectors that Walter Benjamin also uh, encourages us to think about. The private and the public one and the personal which is entirely different. The private and the public are different but uh, it can still be clubbed together in the sense that in uh, the, a private collector, one who collects things privately, we find uh, him, that person, transforming things to something else which has an external value. And it's pretty much the same in a, a public uh, collector as well, uh, except that for a public collector, his act of collecting objects, it almost uh, gets a way more legitimate kind of a status, it's more justifiable and very often we find that getting displayed on a, a social or an, at an academic level, we find that getting uh, increasingly getting manifested in contemporary art forms as well. So the private and the public collector, there is a justifiability about them, there is a legitimacy and a, some kind of a rational and credibility associated with them. But the personal collector, which is what, which is where we can uh, place John in this story, he is not the private or the public collector. There is an inability for him within him to communicate with the rest of the world the value of the things that he is collecting. So for him, the personal collector that he is, the desire towards the thing, the desire towards the object is also about losing himself. He is not able to find himself once he begins pursuing this obsessive 
uh, addictive passion of collecting objects. And in the personal collector's life, we also realize that since it is not something which can be uh, projected well in the public domain, the encounter with the object, it also transforms the thing as well as oneself. The thing transforms in the personal collector's eyes and that is not something which is visible to the rest of the world. But the collector himself also undergoes a radical change which is of course visible to everyone and not certainly in, a, uh, in an encouraging, it is a disappointing change and it is more or less like a fall from the fall and it is more or less like a fall from the glory that was. So, in the personal collector's uh, story like we would see in John's story, we find a uh, loyalty to the thing being displayed and this at some level is very original, very pure. It does not have any other kinds of ambitions uh, steering it forward. And in John's case, if we see John as this anarchic collector, we also realize that the transformation of things is his concern. In his eyes, the otherwise forgettable objects, they undergo a transmission which the others are unable to understand and which he is unable to communicate, which he is unable to get across. And extending Walter Benjamin's arguments, it is also possible to say that an art collector in the contemporary, an art collector who is dallying in objects in the contemporary, the moment he situates himself or herself within the praxis of art, there is a certain respectability that also comes to him. And of course, there is a way in which we can extend these arguments to materiality and to how capitalism changes the world and the way art is being conceived and how things begin to acquire value, how value is being attributed to various objects depending on how it gets situated. Perhaps uh, thinking about the museum as a space is one of the best ways to look at it. If you think about the museum, it is a place of knowledge production, it holds the keys to vast amount of knowledge, but at the same time the world of the museum is not real. Of course, it reflects the reality of the outside, it reflects the reality of uh, the uh, material world which was and which still is, but at the same time there is an unreal nature to the museum. Compare that with the anarchic collector that someone like John is, John in this short story um, Solid Objects. We find that the objects within a museum, it could be completely irrational, it could be a stone, it could be something from the past which cannot be situated in the present in any way, but at the same time there is a way in which we are able to treat it with double ambiguity. We are able to attribute certain value to it so that it adds to the knowledge production and in that sense by extension becomes a significant addition to the understanding of uh, human behavior, understanding of human history itself. In John's case, when Charles visits John and sees all of these uh, terrible objects at home and uh, the things which he had collected randomly from here and there which looks only like rags to Charles, we find that it is an unnatural environment, it is not a healthy environment which out of which anything productive could come and compare that with the museum. It could be the same kind of things which is inside, but it is organized in such a way that it is situated within a certain knowledge system and it is also a naturalized unnatural environment. And this is extremely significant about how different ways in which knowledge systems work and how they are schematically arranged within particular discursive traditions. As we try to wrap up the story, I want you to think about how John as this anarchic collector, he lets the objects to take over his life entirely. And what he does in this process is also very, very intrinsically modernist. He lets go of the need to define them. There is no way in which he tries to position it in such a way that the others can also see how it is projected, where it can be situated and what its value could be. So, he lets go of this entire need to define them, which is what modernist, literary modernism also did to a very large extent. It, they, they, the, the writers, the works that came out, they tried to completely get rid of this 
need to define anything, need to situate a meaning within a context and make it accessible for everyone to see. And this certainly is a process which causes madness. And we find that this precisely is the process which led uh, John slip away into madness. And here, madness is the result of being unable to share his experience. And this story in that sense, it remains as a story which is about a man who's unable to share his story because he fails to situate it within a framework which is readily accessible to others and in a very typically modernist way. Perhaps Virginia Woolf is also trying to tell us that at the end of the day, even when you are telling the story, the stories really have very little role to play in shaping the reality, in shaping the many situations that one is fraught within. And if one is able to look at this story, Solid Objects, as a slice of life from one of those modernist episodes as an extension of one of those ways in which um, literary modernism had been exemplified. I think it is uh, an important key to access the ideas of modernism itself. I encourage you to go through the story and take a look at it by yourself so that you all go also get a sense of uh, the discussions and the many critical frameworks within which modernism has been situated. I thank you for listening and I look forward to seeing you in the next session.